Awesome. Welcome everyone. This is Sharon Fischel from the Alaska Department of Education. We're happy to have all of you here today. Today we have an exciting presentation from Christina. And where did Carolyn go? She's still here. And Carolyn. And I am going to not waste any time and turn it over to the two of them to get started. Thanks, Sharon. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Borbay, and I'm really excited to be here today. I'm going to go ahead and get my screen share up so that we can um, look at some information together. Uh, but while we're doing that, if, <laughs> if you didn't get the sneak peek earlier today, um, what we'd like to do is just welcome everyone to the beginning of our series um, by sharing some of our um, our, our cultural inheritance from our elders. Uh, and so the name of today's series is um, Listening to Scientists and Our Grandmothers. Um, we're gonna be focusing on wellness at work and we'll have six sessions in this series. Um, today's session is Sleep the Key to Everything Else. So I'm so glad you're all here for that one because it's really the foundation to all of our wellness. Um, but before we get going, we wanted to get a sense of who's here with us um, and learning from that kind of cultural inheritance that we received from our elders. And so if folks want to go ahead and either unmute and share or put in the chat um, something, some advice or a motto um, that your grandmother or grandmother-like um, person in your life shared with you, um, that will help us kind of create a collective work um, of, of advice from our grandmothers. Um, so I'm gonna invite folks to go ahead and do that. Um, and we heard, some of you heard Sharon's. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and see if any of our other folks um, on the panel wanna share advice or mottos from their um, grandmother, Pat, Cami, Vanessa, Carolyn, anything that you wanna kick us off with? And so my grandmother taught me when I was a young adult that I'm Carolyn, by the way, if um, I'm in an argument with somebody that I needed to take turns being angry. That's interesting. So not, you don't get, both of you don't, don't get, get to be angry, angry all the time. All the time. Okay. <laughs> Cool. And Carolyn, did you want to just, while you have the floor, um, do a little intro to who you are? Yeah, um, thank you. And thank you for letting me into your circle today. I feel really lucky to be here. Um, for those that I haven't gotten to meet before, my name's Carolyn. And I speak with a stutter, so I don't want to catch you off guard as I begin to stutter. Um, and as we're talking about our grandmothers, I'll introduce myself by, um, by weaving in a, a story of my own grandmother. And my grandmother passed away this last year. Um, she was a, a member of the Wailaki Nation in Northern California and was very much a quiet, stable matriarch of our family. Um, and about 20 years, my, my story is this, about 20 years ago, I was visiting her and I've long been enamored with what scientists are discovering about the human body. And so I was telling her all about what we now know about what babies need. Um, and I was on my feet because I was so excited about telling her about the cellular, like, um, like what happens in a baby's brain down at the cellular level, when you hold them, when, when you talk to them, when you respond to them. Of course, it was all stuff that my grandmother just knew. And when I finally stopped spouting all my scientific information and, and sat down beside her and she reached over and she held my hand and um, some time passed with her silence. And then she said, 
It's long been interesting to me that we think that we're so much better than dogs, but for the most part, puppies get better care from their moms than a lot of babies do, human babies do. And it was so humbling to me as a person who loves um, science, this idea that there's these people among us that just know stuff and don't need the scientific literature to take good care of each other. So that's my introduction. Thank you, Carolyn. I love sure. that. And, and on the topic of babies, so I'm so, I'm so honored that you sh are sharing your grandmother's wisdom with us and that you infused it into this series um, for us today. And we got some good input on the chat from other folks, including um, from Lauren, whose grandmother was excellent with babies. Um, and, but, my, but her comment is how her grandmother just encouraged babies to cry and just let it out. Um, and I love that as like social emotional learning advice for infants, like just go for it, let her gush. Um, we also heard from Maureen, whose grandmother told her waste not want not, uh, from Heather about learning through stories. Um, and I'll just share as we kind of segue into this session together, um, my grandmother who I called Nan, um, was always telling me not to burn the candle at both ends. Um, which was her way of telling me that I needed to get some good sleep. Uh, and so that's what we're going to be talking about together today. Uh, and we'll have time, I just want to let folks know kind of how we're going to um, go through this session together. So we're going to start with an introduction. And this is an introduction that is the preface for why does our wellness matter at all? Um, so I'm going to lead us through that introduction. Um, in our future sessions, um, we're not going to repeat this introduction, but we will have a video version of it available um, for new folks who are joining and popping in and out of these six sessions. Uh, but we'll go through it together today just to lay the groundwork for why this matters. Um, and then we're going to really look at the science and the cultural wisdom around sleep, uh, why it's important, um, what does it do for us, and then we'll focus on some tips and strategies. And so make sure that you have some concrete recommendations for yourself. And then also for thinking about um, how this might come up as a means of supporting wellness at work. So one of the key objectives that we have is really investing in your well-being. We know that all of us have been under tremendous pressure for this extended period of time, this unpredictability. Um, and in our roles as nurturers, um, as caregivers on campus, uh, a lot of times we are also putting out there um, the well-being of others and not carving out time for the well-being of ourselves. Uh, and we want to just acknowledge that it's not just on us to take care of ourselves, but on all of us to take care of each other. And so as we're thinking about this, the reason we keep weaving in this sense of connectedness to colleagues, um, connectedness to our, um, our work community, is because we're trying to shift the paradigm so that we're not just putting out there self-care strategy after self-care strategy, but that we're building a paradigm based on collective care, um, this shared and mutual reciprocity for each other's well-being. And so we'll be leaving that into today's content um, and we'll be leaving you with some specific resources uh, as well. Uh, we're also going to have a discussion portion, so I know we're a small group today. I'm hoping that at the end, towards the end of the hour, that we'll be able to um, share our video screens and really kind of dig in to how we are experiencing um, sleep and what our culture supports in terms of quality sleep and what we want to aim for in terms of shifting some of the norms around sleep. So that said, I'm going to um, just check in. Anybody have anything that we need to do housekeeping wise before we get started? Okay, so here we go. Make sure that I got this teed up. All right, so if there's one thing that we have in common more than we live in our city or town, whoops, sorry, this is advancing a little too fast for me. More than we live in our city or town, more than we live in our house, and more than we live in our car, 
We live in our bodies. Um, this is our common experience of being human and living in these bodies of ours. Kind of like this. Some days being human may feel like all we can do, but most days we strive for more than being just human. We strive for being human with health and vitality so that we can live meaningful lives. This is not just for our own benefit, but so we can be available to fully engage uh, with children, youth, colleagues, and other people in our community and family that we care about. But being human does not happen in a Petri dish. None of us operate within the vacuum of a perfectly controlled environment. <clears throat> we are surrounded by life happening, good and bad. In some moments, the life that surrounds us is indeed wonderful and fulfilling. This may come from things like friends who believe in us, beautiful flowers or trees in bloom, seeing the light bulb come on for a child, colleagues who offer encouragement and support, um, living lives of purpose. And when those lives of purpose become a bit too much for us, there's always the option for some, most of us for a warm bed. Sorry, I'm gonna pause this for just one moment because it is just going way too fast for me. Christina, we're seeing your notes on the next slide too. Oh no, okay. Let me end this and start over. Apologies for that. Um, Sharon, if you wanna pause recording, I can get it set up. Okay, apologies for that glitch. We're gonna go ahead and move forward with how is it that we're being human with health and vitality? Um, so as we know, we're surrounded by life happening, good and bad. Let's talk about some of that good. Um, friends who believe in us, beautiful flowers or trees in bloom, seeing the light bulb come on for a child, colleagues who offer encouraging support, and living lives of purpose. And when those lives of purpose become a bit too much for most of us, there's always the option of a warm dinner and a comfortable bed. But as we know, life is not all ice cream and butterflies. It takes a toll on us when there are things like students who are neglected, chronic student behavioral issues, workloads that feel unmanageable, too few resources to help our students in need. And there may be things like unsupportive managers. And on the hardest days, it's being in a workplace where we feel ineffective. So as we think about those stressors on us being human, what we know is that the experience of ongoing imbalance between our resources and the demands that we face and the resulting stress may damage both our physical health in the short term and the long term. Chronic stress can also impact, so this ongoing pressure and stress and tumultuousness that we're in um, it impacts how we're able to take care of ourselves and how we feel in our body each day. Um, and that's a problem because as we know, more than we live anyplace else, we are living in these bodies of ours. Um, so as we've heard, there are, there are scientists and elders everywhere who are trying to help us mitigate this stress. Um, so there's kind of stress that's around us all the time, but as we know, uh, we're in unprecedented times in terms of um, the chronic nature of the stress that we're under, especially in the work that we're doing um, within schools. Again, as caregivers, as the folks who are showing up for young people, who are navigating things with our families, with our community partners, um, we really want to make sure that we're tapping into the wisdom that's available. So our scientists who are studying practices that help buffer our bodies, our experience of environmental adversity and how that impacts health and vitality have found um, a number of kind of key things that keep us um, closer to a state of well-being under duress. Um, what they've identified are seven strategies or seven buffers um, they identified this by studying individuals, including young people, including people experiencing chronic pain, by studying them to see what were the key elements that rose to the top in terms of promoting resilience, even under these prolonged periods of distress. Um, so we want to talk about those seven buffers today. 
uh, we're not all seven buffers. We're going to start talking about one of those buffers today because any of them that we put into use, um, research shows, mitigates the impact of the stress that we are experiencing. Each of these practices is associated with reducing stress hormones, with enhancing our neuroplasticity. That's a fancy way of saying our ability for our brain to do what we want it to do. Um, and it reduces inflammation in our body. All of these play an important role in counteracting the short and the long-term impacts of stress. Um, and overall, they improve our health and well-being, which is what we're trying to do um, in this series that we're bringing to you today. Um, so when we think about what the scientists have identified as these seven buffers, um, one of the things that we know is that our grandmothers might be rolling our eyes at us, as we heard Pat say, as we heard Carolyn say, they have known all along what are some of these key things in life that we need to be healthy. Um, so the, the basis for this work that we're going to be doing together in this series, again, is an opportunity um, for you to reconnect with the fundamentals of taking care of a human being, taking care of yourself, um, and taking care of each other. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, again, I, we want to just be mindful here. We know that everybody is kind of at different places. If, if your life is a book, right, everybody's in a different chapter um, in their book. And we want to be sensitive to the fact that um, not all of these techniques or strategies or recommendations are going to suit where you are in your story. Um, and so we acknowledge that. And what we're encouraging you to do is take the pieces that are useful for you um, and just leave the rest. So we're talking about sleep today. That can be a loaded experience for folks, um, especially if you have young children at home or um, other responsibilities that may interfere with that. So again, being really sensitive to the fact that not everything works for everyone, but we want to bring you as many different um, opportunities to build this into your wellness practice and build this into your collective care practice as possible. Um, so to kick things off, Carolyn, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. I will unmute myself. Um, so uh, we've already actually really talked about honoring our grandmothers, but we certainly hold that they didn't need this fancy information from scientists and, and to know that some of these um, practices do have, have value. Um, so let's move into quality sleep. Um, I can advance the slide. Um, and in case knowing the science can help us, that's why we're going to go into the science today to better understand how sleep does support the brain. It does support um, multiple systems, but we're gonna focus on the brain. And hopefully we'll come away with um, strategies to support both us and our colleagues and to consider this idea that caring for her basic human needs can help us to buffer the, the stress in our lives from impacting our health. Um, go ahead. Um, so, I'm a visual learner, and so for the other visual learners, I have a tendency to put content actually on the slides to read. And because of our time, I'll be adding less and to move us through these slides. Um, so the consensus of over 1,000 scientific articles is most Adults need from seven to seven and a half hours of sleep to function optimally. Um, once we move down to six hours of sleep, a number of, of disorders become more pre pre prevalent. And um, there are some 
people that have a gene where they'd only need five hours of sleep, but that is a very specific gene. So if you are one of those lucky ones, I'm happy for you. But for the rest of us, we have to consider that maybe we could feel even better by getting at least seven hours of sleep. Um, so why is this? Um, um, so brain structures actually change while we're sleeping and that promotes tissue healing and renewable in our brains and throughout the body. And um, scientists continue to study why we need this much sleep, but the resounding consensus is for some reason, seven to seven and a half hours seems to be the sweet spot for most adults. Um, so what are brain cells doing while we're sleeping? These are just three examples that I personally found most exciting. Um, so the first one is um, with the garbage truck. Um, there's helper cells that they remove the toxins and debris from our brain tissues. And they work better while we're sleeping because while we sleep, the fluids that they have to work within become more fluid. And one of the things that they remove is the plaque. And so um, when you don't get as much sleep over the long haul, we have a tendency to build up more plaque within the brain, which is not a good thing. And the second thing was that these helper cells, they also manufacture nutrients that are known as the miracle grow of the brain that help to, to fertilize our neurons. And then the third thing that we're going to talk about is while we sleep, they also just help um, brain cells can better, um, can regulate our hormones and just um, decrease the stress response system. I think um, as with ACEs information is demonstrating what, when the stress response system is turned down, then it helps the immune system and tissue renewal all over the body. Um, so what happens when we don't get that seven to seven and a half hours of sleep? I'm realizing that most of us don't need the scientific information, but to me, it's helpful to help me um, to prioritize it. So there's compared reasoning, problem solving, learning, attention to detail, reduced emotional regulation as my family can definitely attest to when I don't get enough sleep, um, increased negativity bias, setting us up to select and remember negative memories. I love getting to read this. So this is scientific, this is from to primary source essay, um, primary source articles. And recently when my 15 year old only got two or three hours of sleep, the next day she was having very negative um, uh, thoughts. And it was wonderful to hear her say, but I know that I have just, um, Increased negativity bias because I didn't actually sleep enough. And I was like, yes. 
Um, and then the final thing that we're not going to talk about as much, because this doesn't have to do with the brain as much, but it does um, when you're not getting enough sleep. Um, there is there's a tendency for blood pressure to go up. There's increased risk of diabetes, as well as a whole host of health conditions. Um, so tips for nurturing quality sleep. These are from Matt Walker, who I adore. Um, he's wonderful to listen to and is a, um, a world expert on the science of sleep. We'll give you his website towards the end. But he says that, that if we do nothing else um, to maintain a regular sleep schedule, uh, this can provide an anchor to not just help us to, um, um, to get the hours we need, but it can also become the anchor for our circadian rhythms to um, help us to get more quality sleep as well, because we don't just sleep for seven hours the same way, but there's patterns that go up and down during the seven hours. Um, so there are free apps, um, and your phone might even already have this where you can set a gentle timer um, to tell you to go, to remind you to go to sleep, that it's time to start winding down. So number two, um, our temperature actually needs to drop a few degrees to get us to go to sleep. Um, so um, making sure your room's not too warm. Um, so many of us already know this third one, um, to not have caffeine after 2 a.m., um, 2 p.m., um, but help me to learn the science of that. There's a hormone called adenosine or adenosine that builds up during the day to help us um, be sleepy. And the receptor that adenosine goes into, caffeine has almost the same molecular structure. So that can go in the receptor site um, to block it. Good. Caffeine, and the next one down, alcohol, they also interfere with our melatonin levels. And alcohol, um, from what I understand, even more so. And so with alcohol, you may be going to sleep, you may actually, um, you are technically asleep, but you're not dipping down in pen to REM sleep like you should. And some people say you're also not getting into the deep sleep that comes right before REM. So you're more um, in a, sit, a state of sedation than um, at the quality restorative sleep you disturb you deserve. And number five, um, to schedule time before bed, like an hour before bed to begin um, to wind down. You can turn down the lights in your home um, for the, like an hour or a half an hour halfway just to begin to, to signal to your body to begin to make more melatonin to help you go to sleep. And I think we've all probably, or many of us have heard this, um, to limit your exposure to screens. 
because again, many scientists believe that this is interfering with melatonin. And then finally, for those times when you can't sleep, um, to get out of bed. So you're not gonna to begin to associate your bed with, with lying awake. Um, Christina, can I hand it back over to you? Yeah, and Carolyn, I wanna just thank you because every time you teach this content, I feel like I'm relearning it. And I didn't, I mean, <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, that means I like, I really have to like, I mean, I know this cause we've been working on this for a while now, but then every time I think about it from a new angle and it's just, um, it's so helpful to understand. I'm one of those people who I can't take anything at face value. So if you tell me like, sure, limit your caffeine or avoid alcohol, I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. But then when you explain why, like our brain receptors are actually getting plugged up with this stuff that is gonna keep the sleepy juice from flowing into it. I'm like, oh. And then I think like, how many of us will, I don't know, I'll just speak for my sister and I, cause I know our bedtime routines is like a glass of wine and watch some TV. And I'm like, I think I'm gonna have to really rethink this ritual for my like end of the day wind down. So I'm so appreciative of the combination of just explaining the background behind it um, as well as just connecting it to these real life practices that we need to either change or rethink, or maybe, um, you know, again, when I think about how hard it is to change habits and change routines, um, I really try and think about, okay, well, if I don't change it all the time, what can I change some of the days of the week, or how can I change it a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, you know, even if it's just kind of shifting the schedule by like half an hour so that I do have like a half an hour of screen free wind down time, um, even if I'm still watching my shows um, until Definitely. nine o'clock or so. Um, so thank you again. Yeah, I love science. Thank you. Science and grandmothers. And grandmothers. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just think about like the dump truck thing and I'm like, well, when my grandmother was talking about the candle at both ends. I never really understood like what it mattered if you're, I mean, like aside from the fact that then you just have to hold the candle in the middle, like why does it matter if you're burning the candle at both ends? And now I'm like, right, because that dump truck isn't coming in to remove the plaque and the toxins so that my brain can restore itself for day next the next day. Um, but I wanna shift gears, Carolyn. I mean, we're still talking about sleep, but I also wanted to talk about, you know, this idea of investing in our sleep because it's the key to everything else. So all of the other wellness strategies, all of the other responsibilities that we have, um, investments that we can make in ourselves um, can really be enhanced by making sure we have that seven to seven and a half hours of quality sleep. Um, and so I wanted to just open it up to discussion to talk about um, what are kind of some of the factors that come into play when we think about integrating this into our lives, both for our individual selves. And in just a moment, we're going to talk about how we can potentially infuse this into our, um, you know, our, our um, teams at work, um, work with our colleagues around making sleep a priority. So um, I'm going to pause here and just check in with folks. So. We heard the science, we know what our grandmothers would say, but how do you see our culture valuing sleep? I have some thoughts about it, but I wanted to see kind of what comes up from you in terms of the messages that you hear, the attitudes, um, the norms around whether quality sleep is something that is a high priority in our culture or something that is getting the short end of the stick. Anybody want to unmute and share? I see Brandy sharing. She's sharing the truth, which is there is never enough time in the day. That is for sure. Hi, this is uh, Heather. I just wanted to share, um, and this is really resonating with me because recently I've been in two groups with uh, one with um, a school staff and then one group just this morning with uh, folks from across the state and sleep 
nap time came up in both groups. Mm -hmm. Today, people were really talking about being exhausted. They were working in small groups and they just, it was 10 o'clock in the morning and they just said they were exhausted. And mm -hmm. so that connects about sleep. Um, and then uh, one of the school staff that I was working with, one of the ideas that came out was could we somehow, <laughs> and they sort of offered it um, as a joke, but like for real, could there be a way to build sleep into the school day? Because again, adults are exhausted. Mm -hmm. So this is really resonating with me. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think about, you know, as an adult, I kind of think back on my my time as a student in schools and I remember that, that just talking about like adults in schools being exhausted and I I now as an adult can reflect back on this game that was one of my favorite games that our teachers would let us play sometimes in the classroom which was called heads down thumbs up did anybody else play heads down thumbs up which as a kid, I don't know why, I just loved it because they would turn off all the lights in the classroom and you would put your head, your forehead down on your arm and your arm would be flat on your desk. So your head is down and then you put your thumb up and there's somebody, one of the other students who gets to go around and put down people's thumbs. And I love the tactile experience of like feeling somebody's like hand clasp over mine. And we were so excited when we got to play the, I mean, it is the most ridiculous game. like. It's, you're not running around, there's no prizes or toys or flashing lights. Um, and then I realized like my teachers were exhausted. Like we got to play heads down, thumbs up when my teacher was exhausted and she couldn't deal with this anymore. And she just wanted to have a quiet dim lit room for 15 minutes or however long we were playing for. What are other ways that we feel this coming up in our culture, the messaging that we get from others about how much there is to do during the day and what if you are not doing those things and you're sleeping instead? Carolyn? I can go. I think there's this, I, I, I feel like we give, give lip service to sleep, but there's oftentimes this feeling that those who actually get enough sleep, they just lack willpower are they not as motivated or they're just not as strong to be able to get through and survive with less sleep um, um, to do what needs to get done? Yeah, Carolyn, I mean, I, I changed this in my life, but I worked in an environment a few years ago where it, it also felt like somehow you weren't as important. If you were able to get enough sleep, if you were able to get like seven whole hours of sleep, it meant somehow you, you're, you weren't doing the emails at 11 p.m. or you weren't like getting up at four or five to review that draft report and, that, and somehow that may, made you less um, essential or less vital to the workflow during the day. And so getting emails from colleagues at all hours was almost like, it was, it was valued as like, wow, you're really like giving it everything you have. But then I look back on it and I'm like, I don't even, your brains weren't even functioning. Right? Like you weren't, you weren't even able to really function optimally because you were getting three hours of sleep a night, but it was somehow lauded as like this, um, this ideal. So I want to just kind of sh advocate for shifting the culture, right? So a lot of times we're receiving these messages that are more coded or more indirect and thinking about how does that land with us and then how do we feel about ourselves and the choices that we make. Um, but I also want to put it in the context of how can we do that not only for ourselves, but then start shifting the culture in our workplaces as well. So again, this all of this applies to yourself and to your colleagues, but obviously to your families to your extended families, to your social networks, to your communities. Um, but for the Wellness at Work series, we're gonna keep our examples specific um, to, to the workplace. And for you all, a lot of times that means um, our schools, our school districts, our education system, um, and the services that we're, that we're providing there. And so there are some key recommendations. And again, 
we have all of the references for these if you're interested, but looking at what really helps in terms of shifting cultural norms at work, uh, making sure that you're checking in. Um, so I work, I, I, I was smart and I changed jobs so that I work in an environment now where if you are sending an email late at night or early in the morning, um, people will reach out and just check in. And, and there can be reasons why doing that makes sense. Um, but being part of a culture of care where people will ask like, is everything okay? Um, do you need anything? Is there anything I can take off of your plate? You know, So folks who are really looking out for each other by checking in if you're getting one of those late night or um, other indications that someone might be um, keeping unusual hours. Um, the other aspect is, is pr um, practicing what you preach. So making sure that you're talking about how you prioritize rest and recovery and compromises or choices or changes in routine that you might be making for yourself and your family or your household um, to incorporate some of these, um, these grandmotherly recommendations or science-based strategies. Um, and then the other piece is um, ideas are, um, as Carolyn mentioned, there's so many um, apps, um, whether it's smartphones or smart devices where you can have apps or sleep alarms. And just like we do other sorts of like walking challenges, movement challenges with our colleagues, thinking about making it a team effort um, to use those apps um, to follow those kind of sleep strategies. My favorite is the Calm app. Um, and they have sleep stories that basically like hypnotize you to sleep. And then my sister and I talk about which were our favorite sleep stories. Um, I know, I think Carolyn, your girls use those sleep stories sometimes too, but they don't seem to like them as much as I do. <laughs> um, and then again, you know, this is kind of back to the check-in asking about work-life balance, um, but again, really making it, making it part of the norm in our conversation with colleagues so that that sense of, not judgment or criticism, but opportunity um, and care and nurturing kind of comes across. Um, so before we wrap up today, we did just wanna make sure that there's something of a call to action. Um, and so the idea here is not just imparting information, um, but giving you inspiration to change behavior. And so I, Carolyn and I are just really interested if um, either any of the things that we recommended things that your grandmother or elders recommended or other strategies that you're using um, that you'd go ahead and share with folks. So you can unmute yourself or put in the chat any of the one to three things that you might do or continue to do to support yourself and your colleagues in getting this quality sleep as part of your wellness plan. Anybody walking away with new ideas or anybody um, bringing recommendations that you could share with your peers? I love the idea of turning down the lights in your home like halfway, like an hour before bedtime. To me, it's such an easy thing to do. Um, I, I've done that like twice, but something that I want to work on more. Carolyn, I know, I know the, um, I know that I mentioned that every time I hear you teach this, I, I feel like I need to adopt a new component, and so. I was listening to the, caf the, the situation about caffeine and realizing that my like after dinner chocolate square might count as caffeine. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think I'm just gonna have to eat that earlier in the day. Okay. <laughs> That's my plan before two, chocolate before two. Um, so um, Maureen shared in the chat that she'd like to do um, no screens after eight o'clock and try to exercise in the late afternoon. Thank and exercise you. is, um, exercise is um, another recommendation that, that we saw over and over again to help your sleep. So good luck, Maureen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we did want to leave you with some resources, and we have more. Um, but as Carolyn mentioned, her favorite sleep guru is Matt Walker. Um, and so I put this in the chat earlier, but uh, his his website here has excellent resources. Um, there's he's kind of particularly accessible for an academic. 
Um, and so it's really, if you want more information, more recommendations, more understanding, um, we wanted to point you in this direction. Um, that's a scientist. Um, but we also wanted to remind you about grandmothers, right? So any of the elders in our life oftentimes um, are looking out for us and they're reminding us that it's okay to take care of yourself by prioritizing quality sleep. So whether it's burning the candle at both ends, don't do it, whether it's get good rest, um, inquiring after how you've slept, I feel like these are kind of all of the things that grandmothers come to the table with to let us know that um, getting a good rest is important. Um, and it's a fundamental to taking care of ourselves as human beings. Um, and we want to just remind you that as much as we want this to be about you, that it's not just you who stands to benefit from this. So we believe that all of you deserve support and opportunities to heal from the stress that you've been experiencing, just like the children and youth that you're serving in schools. Um, the improved cognitive functioning and the emotional regulation that's going to result from some quality sleep is going to benefit the other humans in your life. Um, and we want to remind you that we're doing this together, right? We are trying to shift the norm to a collective care model uh, where we're building and continually reinforcing an infrastructure for collective care in order to create a culture where you can tend to your basic needs, kind of like what Heather was saying, like, how can we build nap time into this agenda? Um, and at the same time, supporting the wellness of our students, because we know that's taking up a lot of the time. Um, and so we wanted to carve out this time to really talk about um, how do we do that for ourselves and each other on campus. Um, and we also wanted to just let you know, there are those seven other, so there's a total of seven buffers, and we're going to be talking about that throughout the series. Um, so these are the seven. Quality sleep is what we talked about today. Supportive relationships we're talking about next. Mindfulness mental health, access to nature, physical movement, and nutrition. So we have resources on all of these. We'll be sharing um, elements of this in our upcoming sessions. Our next session is Tuesday, November 9th, again at 3.30. Um, so we're doing these, these um, wellness sessions every other week on Tuesday afternoons. Um, so we're looking forward to A, um, having no technical difficulties in future sessions, um, and um, being able to kind of continually build this peer network um, of learning, of support, of care, so that you can um, really um, restore yourselves and nurture yourselves because we know that it's hard and we know that it's exhausting. Um, and since we know some of these pieces that are going to make a shift that are going to help you reconnect and re-energize, we wanna carve out these hours um, to help you practice that. Um, so Sharon, I'm going to go ahead and um, hand it off to you in case there's any other housekeeping items before we wrap up today. I don't have any off the top of my head. Be looking for the email that comes out from Pat and I probably tomorrow that tells you which um, sessions will be offered next Tuesday at 3.30 and Christina and Carolyn will be back in two weeks. And we also, we welcome your feedback. So um, aside from the technical glitches, we welcome your feedback if there's things that you'd like to see more of or less of. We welcome, um, if you have inquiries about how to replicate this module, we can make the resources available to you along with the facilitator's guide. So again, we wanna make this as um, usable as possible. So let us know how we can, how we can do that. 